Let, um, before we start, let's, let me, uh, I want to use this as my, uh, can you slide that thing over? So, yeah, okay. What? Yeah, <laughs> oh, wow, that'd be change, huh? <laughs> Scary, huh? <laughs>
Okay. Alrighty, let's roll them. It's pink here. Um, okay, uh, last lecture. So, um, I guess a few announcements. The um, one is I'll have office hours next Monday morning just like normal. So, 9.30 to whenever, okay. I'll leave with everybody. I have a luncheon meeting, so I have to I'll leave by lunch. But I'll, so office hours next Monday. Uh, no class. Right? The um, smile, uh, good. Uh, <laughs> um, the projects will be due on Monday. Okay, you can turn them into my office, or you can turn them in the box. I guess they'll be due Monday evening. I guess. Okay, uh, whenever that is, Monday. At what time exactly? Um, 8 p.m. Let me check with the. We'll give you a. We'll give you a time. Okay, so I, someone's got to go pick them up. So probably, probably like six o'clock or something like that on Monday. Okay, so um, check the the test benches have been fixed. There's been some problems with them in the past. So uh, uh, make sure you're using the latest version of the test benches because they've tried they've fixed some bugs in them this over time. Uh, let's see here. Um, I'm going to do is go over the the final today. I'll be main topic today. Yeah. Are you going to adjust the write-up requirements? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. The write-up requirements. Uh, basically, the write-up requirements. Make sure. Once you mail me, make sure I do that. Okay. Um, I, I kind of want them like last. Um, I know they're a little bit too much. Okay. So we'll. I'll strip it down a bit for you and. How they were on the previous project was about right. I want to have a little bit of discussion on your design approach, what's interesting about your design. I want to. I do want a couple of hand calculations of critical numbers, like the, do, the dominant pole, the compensation pole, and the first non-dominant pole. I want. I want that calculation. Maybe a calculation of the slew rate. Um, but uh, beyond that, um, I, I'm not going to ask for you know two pages for. Like, like, we, like we did last time. You know, something like that. Okay. Um, anything else? Let's see. Uh, oh yeah. On you should be getting. Did anybody get email with their grades? There. No. So the plan is we'll send out. You know, because we can't. It's almost impossible for us to put stuff online unless we give you a special number. We didn't do that earlier. So. Um, what we're gonna do is email you your all your homework and exam and project grades as we understand them, okay? If you disagree, bring in, you know, to either myself or Saurabh or David, just to one of us, uh, or mail us to start with, I guess, uh, uh, what your disc the discrepancy is and we'll try to figure it out. I mean, the way to get it figured, the way to, the last line of resort is if we can't figure it out right away because of some mistake that we obviously made is for you to bring in your homework or project or exam, and we'll check that out. Yeah. What if you didn't get them back? Like, if you had like a bunch of regrades and they just never returned to you? <laughs> they should be returned. So, what, what are you missing? Homework for a regrade. Homework for a regrade. Well, look at your um, well. Do you know what what it should be when you look at the uh, you know what value we should have had on it? Yes, I talked to the reader. Yeah, I'm just saying when you get your little list of all your pro on your scores, you can look and see if you got the v right value there. If you did, if you want to try to, well, try to have all the homeworks. I will attempt to have those all by Monday, for sure, in my office there. So um, if you can want to come by, then we'll. I have every, you know, regraded, ungraded, to be graded thing there. So I'll. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Anything else? Any other? Uh? Okay. Um, the homework. Okay. Like I said, uh, that one. This. Just let me 
outline again, you know, I'd say, since we didn't do a lot of that, I think it's a pretty small step, but I just wanted you to at least think about inductors, okay, right? And, you know, the problem is, you know, um, you know, I guess one of them was figure out the the gain that you get, okay. And what's going to happen, you're going to write, just go to the small signal model, and the only thing different now is we've got this J omega L term here, okay. And what's going to happen is you're going to end up, as you work out the, uh, this is our load, as you work out the transfer function, get into a sort of standard form, and you always can get into standard form if this is kind of like Z load. This is the impedance on this node, right? So it's going to be something like R load in parallel with R0. That'll be the low frequency value, right? Because we know that has, to, well, I guess the low frequency value will be sh zero, right? right God, oops. Okay, so it's going to be, anyway. There'll be, um, I'm not quite, I shouldn't write down. Well, I know what it is. It's something like J omega L plus RL or something like that. Uh, that's not true. All right. <laughs> Calculate the impedance of this of this node. Multiply it times GM. You'll find the gain there. Okay. So you find out what ZL is, and it'll be some function of you know omega in the numerator and you know and something like and the denominator will be like you know minus omega squared times LC plus something plus one, and you can see what will happen here at, at this omega squared LC. Term, it, these things will resonate out. This, this, these two terms will cancel out. Well, that is what happens at the peak of the gain for this. That will be the most, the highest value impedance at that point in time. And so that's how you work these things. So you figure out where the resonance is, what it's a function of, go to the resonance point. So those things cancel out. There'll be some terms left over, and that will then define the value of the gain at that point. And just like on the input here, when we did this. You know, we have a couple of inductors here on the input. Calculate the input impedance, just like we always did, using a small signal model. You'll end up with something like this omega squared LC plus 1. That's the resonance of this circuit down here, okay? Then what you do is go to that resonance point, if we're calculating Z in, so you go to the omega naught value, and at that frequency, then you evaluate what the, f what the impedance looks like, okay? And that's kind of what this problems are. Right. So that's what's different, I guess, about this is there's a resonance idea that you look at there. Very generally, you look to DC. Now we look at this resonance value, this omega naught, right? And typically, it's one over root LC. This circuit here, this L source and L gate, in effect, what I'll just tell you what the answer is kind of going to be. LS pretty much sets the input impedance level. You, you get it. There's two variables you have to control, right? One you need to control is the value of the impedance hat. We want to set it equal to 50 ohms. Okay, so that's one thing we want to set. So that's one constraint. The other constraint is we got to set omega zero. So we need two constraints we have to, to set to have this look like 50 ohms at the resonant frequency. So that's why you have to have two inductors, LG and LS. And in effect, LS is what you use to sort of set the 50 ohms, and LG you use to move the resonance around so it occurs at the right frequency, so that you can have it at the same frequency that you have your load at. So in other words, we design this in such a way that we resonate out this input capacitance, set the input impedance to 50 ohms, and have it resonate at frequency omega naught. And then we also set the inductor in the drain circuit to also resonate at that same frequency. So we have maximum ZL at that point, and we have 50 ohms looking in. So that's kind of design of an LNA. Yeah. Can you quickly explain what resonate out was, because that's what the frequency we have to do. Okay, so let me just do that one. Let, let's just take... No. Well, let's not, let's not do exactly the same as your homework. Let's do something else. <laughs> All right. Let's do this. What this means, to resonate out means this. What I'd like to, I have a, this is kind of what I did in the last lecture, right? Okay. Here's sort of R gate, L gate, and here's CGS, which is pretty big, right? And then we also potentially have a CGD, okay? And if we have, let's say we end up with, um, 
you know, let's just put a resistor here for right now. Okay. All right. Okay, so the capacitance on this node here potentially could be what? CGS plus GM RL Miller multiplied times CGD, right? So this is sort of C gate. So this capacitance plus the Miller multiplied value of this, okay? So without the inductor there, I'm going to have a my 3 dB frequency is going to be what? Well, it's going to be 1 over R gate times C gate, right? So we see this full value of all this capacitance, this, Miller, this multiplied capacitance of CGS. Now, if we put this inductor there, what's the new problem that we have? So the problem we've really got is RG, here's VN, LG, and the capacitor, and we're kind of we're trying to calculate this voltage here, VG. And here's CG. And once we calculate VG, we know the gain is going to be simply, you know, the gain of the circuit is going to be VG times G sub M times Z out, whatever it is, okay, which is RL in parallel, whatever. So what is VG? Well, this. So VG is equal to VN, it's a voltage divider, times 1 over J omega CG times RG plus J omega LG plus 1 over C J omega CG. Okay, let's multiply top and bottom by J omega CG. We end up with 1 over J omega times RG, J omega CG RG, that's times that. I get a, well, oh, I'm do it like this, but minus omega squared LG CG plus this plus 1, right? I don't know why I twist, turn those around, but. So J omega CG times this gives us 1. J omega CG times J omega LG gives us minus omega squared LG CG. And J omega CG times RG just gives you J omega CG RG. Okay. Look at this. I have, it's of this form. Let me rewrite that. VN 1 over 1 minus omega squared LG CG plus J omega CG RG. Okay. Look what happens at omega equal to 1 over root LGCG. This thing goes to 0. That's the resonance. That's what we call by resonating out that capacitance. Okay. And at, so now at that frequency, we can plug into here and we can see what this ratio is going to be. VG over VN evaluated at omega equal to omega zero, and that's what you want to do your input impedance at, is at this resonant frequency, is going to be 1 over J omega zero CG RG, which is equal to 1 over J um, LG over CG this is kind of to the one half, one over this, one over RG. Right? So this is the this is an omega. Okay, yeah. So this is what the ratio of VG over VN will be at this resonant frequency. And depending on the values of LG, C G, and RG, this number can be greater than one. Right? Right? So actual fact. What I'm saying is that for this circuit, I can put a V in here, and I actually have gain to this point. Not only does this capacitor not hurt me, but I actually end up with actually peaking up, getting larger at this point here. So that's resonating out this capacitance, and in fact, 
when you resonate it out, if you have a high Q, in other words, high Q means this R is small. As this R gets smaller, this, this peaking result gets even larger. So that's kind of what it's all about. So I, I think your homework problem was just do this for the load, this case here, you know, figure out what happens with load. And, and this input, this is the trickiest one, looking into here, and just do the old thing. Do a V test and calculate I test. Use a small signal model for this and just use J omega L and move it into the right form. And I guess the only tricky thing is you have to understand is it, you know, go to this resonant frequency, figure out what that is. This resonant frequency will be a function of LG and LS for you. And the input impedance will be a function of probably both of them too, right? So you'll have to just look at those equations and figure it out. Okay? I'll have a simple problem on the final on this stuff. This is a real simple one. Just make sure you understand what an inductor is about, right? So but nice to have done that more. But. Okay. Any questions about I'm going to talk about the final now, but before we go into that, any questions about grading, um, anything that's going to happen besides the final? Any issues, project, homework? Okay, final. Final will be inclusive. All material for the whole year relatively equally balanced. Okay, so it won't particularly put a whole lot more on the last half since the project, since the midterm. Uh, maybe 40-60, but, you know, 50-50, 40-60, worst case, okay, all right. Uh, the, um, the problems after the midterm are a little bit harder, so it may, even if it's the same number of problems, it may be a little bit harder for those. Uh, you get two pages of notes. So you can have your mid note, page of notes used for your midterm, you can wrap another page of notes. Okay, so you get two pages of notes. Okay, you can write as much as you can on both sides, whatever. Bring calculators. Okay, so make sure you bring calculators. You'll need those. Bring extra batteries. <laughs> right. Um, let's see. Uh, the um, I will not. I, it will be a little bit longer than the midterm, but not a lot longer. So you should have plenty of time. Okay, I will. We will. Work on that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, I guess that's kind of it. So uh, now I'm, what I'll do now is I'll just kind of go through all the lectures and just tell you what I think is important, what's not important, and uh, then I have some old finals. There's several old finals on on the site, right? Uh, there's a bunch of them there. So I, I got a couple of them here. I'll make sure these. I got two of them here. I just dug through my notes. Fall 2003, and uh, that's a midterm. So. Well, it's a fall 2003 final here I got here, and I can, I'll put, make sure that's on, I think it is. Okay, so any questions in the big picture of how the midterm works, or the final works, right? Okay. Okay, so let's, um, sure. Do you, do you know how final you use next year for something? Um, okay, I'll have office hours on Monday. I'll ask the TAs to do a final review. Okay, so we'll, we'll see. Did they say they didn't say anything about that yet? Did they? Okay, I'll ask them. We'll try to have a, a review someday. Okay, so we'll, we'll try to set that up. Okay. Okay. Alrighty, let's do the whole course here in one hour, one half hour. <laughs> we can do that, right? Okay, the modeling stuff. Um, you I think you understand the models. We um, the physics. Forget. You know, I'm not going to quiz you on any of that physics stuff I talked about at the beginning here. Uh, in the midterm, of course, you had that one problem on sort of designing a strange transistor. I doubt we'll do that again. Spice. The stuff on spice that I did in I didn't actually didn't even do it in the lecture, but it's in the notes. We won't ask any questions on that. So I think this first set of lectures are. Not too much. Okay. All right. So that's about it for the first lecture. That was not much there, right? Oops. Oh no. Uh, ah. Sorry. Start from scratch again here. Actually, I should go to the history. Right? 
Where's history? History. New. Where's history? What? Control H to that? <laughs> Lucky on that one. <laughs> Blue Nile. Oh, here, here, here. Okay. Okay. And okay. All right. So I, I think these single transistor things, you know, which we did a long time ago, you're pretty good at these things now, but clearly I'm going to keep testing that. So it'll be some, you can almost be sure there's going to be some test, uh, some problem on biasing up a single transistor and calculating gain, input impedance, and output impedance of a single transistor stage of some sort. Okay. Maybe all the way, maybe a diff pair instead of a source follower, common source, or common gate, but uh, for sure there's going to be some. The classic problems that we start off the year on, right, was big GM, gain, input impedance, input and resistance, and output resistance. Right. Okay, so that's what this whole lecture was about, this kind of thing here. Source followers. Um, probably should, I've been fairly lax in the lectures on not including the body effect stuff, right? You know, don't assume that's true. Be sure you're able to include, you know, the effects of the body effect, especially on these simple trend problems since you otherwise are almost too simple. Right? We sort of did analysis for all of those. Um, okay, diff pairs. Now we know diff pairs, of course, of a are beginning of a whole series of things. There's the straightforward resistive loaded diff pairs. Then we went into the diff pairs with the current source load. Then we dealt with diff pairs with current source loads that are cascoded, okay, to get higher gain, which are telescopic. Then we did a diff pair, which is folded, which is really all the same thing. It's all this this basic circuit just, you know, manu maneuvered around to get higher gain out of it. I mean, and so I, I'll get that in a second, but clearly you need to understand diff pairs. It's really a very important part of this thing. You know, what common mode, what's differential mode, how you calculate the gain. What happens if I give you a signal that's both common mode and differential mode? In other words, if I give you a signal like a, cir a system, a, a circuit like this, <laughs> Not like that. How about like this? Camera switch. Thanks. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff we did with these things, right? And since, you know, in some cases, you know, with, with like the Folded cascode and um, telescopic. I mean, it's the entire amplifier is just simply this differential pair is improved. I mean, basically what we did is we improved the output resistance of this by cascoding this transistor and this transistor. That's our telescopic. What I was going to say is that what happens if I give you a problem like this, okay, where I put the input only on one side, for example? Well, then we have and take the output off this side. Let's say. <coughs> Then you need to figure out if I was, and let's say I had a, let's say I was to have a current source down here, I simply just had a resistor. RS. I mean, that actually works just fine, right? I mean, you can actually have a, just a resistor down here, <coughs> and this circuit will work, okay? The problem is the common mode gain won't be very high, or it won't be very low, right? So we'll have a relatively bad common mode rejection ratio. So, <coughs> what that means is, you're going to need to calculate both the common mode and differential mode response. Okay, so what is the common mode signal here? Well, it's this plus this divided by two. So it's Vn plus zero divided by two. So the common mode signal is Vn over two. The differential mode gain is this minus that. So it's Vn minus zero, which is equal to just a Vn. So what's the output? <coughs> the output, the out, 
is equal to <coughs> I mean, wow. So we just take the output. Well, let me not do this. Let me not make this a current. I want to make this a fully, truly differential. So let's say I put a V bias here. So these are just two current sources here. Okay. So I want this circuit. Okay. So question? Question? There's an over two for the VIC, but not for the ID. Long, long week. <laughs> <laughs> Common mode is the average value of the voltage here, right? Differential is the difference, right? Okay. Okay. V out for this side here, you need to, it's only a single ended output. So that needs, so what is that? It's going to be equal to V out common without a two, right? Plus, or actually minus V out differential over two. That's the voltage on this side, whereas the voltage on this side is you know, V out common plus V out differential over two, okay? So we just take one side, this is what the V out value will be. Now we have V input common and V input differential. How do we calculate V output common and V output differential? Well, of course, V output common equals A common mode gain times V input common. V output differential equals A differential mode gain times V input differential. Right. So V out is going to be equal to A. And then we, for these, we got to go down and look here. So this is A common mode times V in over 2. And this is A differential mode times V in. So you plug this into here. And what do we end up with? We end up with V out equal to A common mode V in over 2 minus V out differential, which is ADM. V in, and because there's a 2 here, divided by 2 as well. So you need to be able to do that. You know, work from not just pure differential and pure common mode. Then you have to go in and calculate the common mode signal gain and differential mode gain of this circuit and plug in the answers. Okay, so be very conversant with going back and forth between differential and common mode, and that's you know pretty basic stuff. Okay. Uh, this was about what happens in differential in differential circuits when you put um, a large differential swing across this input. Okay, and so uh, if we have a large differential swing, and that's what you're seeing in your projects right now, these circuits end up. Can we go to the back to the? Okay, so as we go a large differential swing, what happens? This thing. This differential pair sort of turns into a current source, right? It turns it, as soon as we get the too big a differential voltage across these two inputs, this circuit goes up either to be an ISS positive direction or ISS in the negative direction, right? And of course, if V out, that just times the resistance value, right? So, so understand about basically how differential modes, differential circuits work. They, in the large signal, they kind of turn into current sources. In the small signal, of course, they have this linear gain funk part right here. And that's important to you when we do the, the um, so here's that stuff I just talked about, the common mode, half circuit analysis. So how we calculate stuff through this half circuit analysis business I talked about. And you know this point here, this little circuit right here, is that sometimes you can mismatch these circuits a little bit, even though we rely a lot on them being matched. If I throw out this resistor here, yeah, there'll be a little bit different current on these two sides. How is it going to be different? The difference is going to be is that the VDS of this transistor is not the same as the VDS of this transistor. So that means we'll have a little bit different current flowing on this side because we have you know, it's the one plus lambda term because the VDSs are different. Yeah, that's a little mismatch. But, you know, often that's not very important because how do you compensate for that mismatch? Well, you'll put a little small offset voltage across these inputs. You know, just tweak those inputs a little bit. And if there's a lot of gain in this circuit, a very small change of the offset voltage across these inputs will compensate for the fact that you have a mismatch actually in your circuit up here. So it doesn't really make much difference. If you start mismatching things like having different size transistors here, make the W over L of these two transistors really different, then it's going to be harder and harder to, by just changing, adding this offset voltage, will get larger and larger. 
and sometime it may just get too big for you actually able to compensate for the mismatch that you have. But mismatching the VDSs because it comes in through the lambda term, which is not very important, is really not very much generally. And that saves you some. Why would you do this? Save area, right? Okay. That's um that stuff. Okay, so let's go back. I'm not get rid of this. Current sources. Okay, so that was there's a lot of choices there for good little test problems. So we start off with good old simple source, and then we, you know, what's our goal of a current source is actually to try to have as a function of the voltage across the current source, we'd like it to be flat. Okay. Of course, when it current source gets too little voltage across it, it goes into linear region operation. Well, that, you know, I just love those little problems where figuring out what kind of swing you have on this output. I mean, when does these transistors go into linear region operation? I mean, I, I for sure that will be asked, okay? And so we have more and more complex uh, current sources. So we cast code this thing, right? And we talk about looking the in, into here, the impedance looking down at this node because of the source degeneration. Here's a question for you. What kind of feedback is this? Just jumping ahead about 10 lectures, right? 20 lectures. So this is a feedback circuit, right? This high input impedance here is happening because there's a feedback going on in this single in this cascode. What kind of feedback is it? Was it? Shunt series, series, series. Okay. We well, got two more choices. <laughs> okay. Someone want it? Series, series? You sound definite. Okay, why? Why don't you use your microphone? I'm not sure. <laughs> for um, this series for the output because it's sensing the current. And we're sensing down in the source here. So typically we're sensing the source. We're probably doing. Series sensing, okay, that's good, okay. And the feedback because you have um, a V feedback right there, and then the voltage that's going to that um, transistor, the M2, so you have a um, V error across the. Yeah, so right, sounds right. Yeah, yeah. it's a little tricky because yeah, what's the input to the circuit? I mean. It's only an output here, right? So where's the input side? So I'd have to define what an input is somewhere in the circuit. Let's say I put an input voltage right here. Then it's maybe more obvious that we're feeding back a voltage right here. Here's the input voltage, and the air voltage is right across here, right? So that's right. But looking in the output here, it's series type sensing. Series type sensing means high output impedance, right? Which is what we want for a cascode current source. Okay. Could you just <coughs> could you just have noticed that it was high output impedance from the feedback and just know that it has to be sorry. That's a good way to check your answer. I think that's right. <laughs> right. So you know, know, knowing that the output impedance is going to be very high, I mean, it better be sorry sensing somehow, right? And so then figure out why. Yes, I would agree with that. Okay. Um, Cast code source. What this is all about, so this is the swing business, right? So when do things go into linear region? And what's important about this and I, is these kinds of circuits is what you're looking at it relative to this output voltage here. So what transistor is going to go into linear region first? I mean, that's something you've got to get a good feel for. What's going to go into linear region first is no doubt the transistor connected to that output, okay? So start looking at the transistor that's connected directly to that output, because that's the one that's no doubt going to go into linear region first. So that means M2. Well, when does M2 go into linear region? M2 goes into linear region as soon as the voltage across M2, VDS, gets less than VDSAT. So the problem is we've got to figure out what the voltage on the source is. So for this circuit, what we have to do is we've got to start down here, go up to the gate here, it's a VT plus a VD sat. Go up to here. It's another VT plus another VD sat, and go down to the source, and then we can find it out. So we we march around these VGSs. We know what VGSs are. I mean, that's something that's that's what makes and that's maybe you've all come through that you know realization that this this idea of using VGS is like a fixed voltage 
is extremely useful. If you don't do that, you really can't analyze these circuits. But it's actually quite a sophisticated idea because what you're saying is all these volu all these transistors are in saturation. They're working like I expect them to work when they're in saturation. And what's going to happen when I finish the circuit, I'm going to check to make sure everything's in saturation because if they're not, I can't make these approximations. But if I can, I can use this like a little voltage source. And it's a self-consistent argument that we're really using here to make this all work. So march up one VGS, march up another VGS, come down another VGS. We can find the voltage here. Then we know that this voltage has to be at least a VT plus 2 VD sat above that source. This does not mean this is the only voltage on this drain. When I, when I, maybe that's what's maybe confusing some of you. When I write, write this down like this, I'm not saying this is the value of the voltage there. Probably what I should have here is that this is the minimum voltage that I can have here. It's not that voltage. That's probably confusing some of you. I, I see now why I often get that question right. Because <laughs> here I got it stated there. This is just the minimum voltage. It can be this voltage or greater, and this voltage will still be in saturation. Okay, everybody see that? All right. So you can't figure out the drain voltage, okay, directly. There's no self con something else has to set that drain voltage. In this case, this voltage is going to be set by some external circuit that we don't even have C here, right? So I'm just plotting things as a function of V out. Okay, so all right. Okay. So first thing is this guy's going to be going to the linear region. We figured out when, as soon as it gets within a this value right here. That's the minimum voltage it can be. Because at that point in time, that'll drop to a VD sat across this transistor right here. Could be larger. Now, once this goes into linear region operation, of course it's kind of a it, when it marginally goes in, you know, it's not really a, a resistor. But I think the way to think about it is begin to think about this as beginning to be a resistor. It's a resistor of size 1 over GM, actually. In linear region operation, a transistor becomes 1 over GM is its, its resistance value. Okay, That's pretty small. It's pretty small compared to R0 of M1. So any voltage we put up here is a voltage divider, right? It's a voltage divider between the 1 over GM of M2 and the R0 of M1. So basically, this voltage at the source now is controlled by this drain. So this voltage now suddenly gets plied down right to this drain of M1. So then we can watch that voltage, and we can sort of see when that when M1 goes into linear region operation. And sure enough, it'll go into linear region operation as soon as we get to this value, VT plus VD sat. That will set this voltage, this transistor, right at the edge of saturation. If we get less than that, then this transistor goes in linear region. And that's all shown here, right? First, that first transistor goes in linear region, and then the second one goes into linear region operation. Okay. Of course, this little set of events here happens over again and over again in many of our circuits, right? So, figure out where the VD, figure out where the source is, start from where the output is, work your way through the rest of the circuit. Of course, this is not a good bias condition because this is a lot more voltage on this strain than needed. It's a VT plus a VD sat because we could live all the way down to just a VD sat. So we should bias this differently, and we have that high swing stuff we talked about. OK. Triple, you can keep doing this. All right. Um, this is the high swing thing. This is one way to do high swing. There's several other ways. But what you're really trying to do is set this voltage. Here's the cascode on this side over here. We're trying to set this voltage to the minimum voltage it can be, and it's going to be one VD sat above the ground. And you'll do all you can. And how you do that? Well, the way you set it is, it's this gate, this gate to source here. Well, the be VD sat here. That's the minimum voltage. That's what we want to have. So we'll go up here, a VT plus two VD sats, because we have a VT plus VD sat of this transistor plus this VD sat we want to left over. Then we go up again. We come down, and so this just this little bias network here allows this to be uh, sitting right at VT plus two VD sat. Okay. Um, Wilson source. Recognize this Wilson source. I don't know how many people. Will, I always put these Wilson sources in, prod, in just to see if you can pattern match, right? <laughs> can you? If I turn it upside down and maybe put it, maybe turn one of the transistors sideways, you should be able to look at any of these circuits 
and topologically change them, move them around so you can sort of see what that circuit really is. I mean, don't, don't just memorize the current source here. <laughs> this is a PMOS and an MOS. I mean, you know, be able to do all the possible variations of that, right? It's, you gotta, should have that flexibility. Yes? Um, for the type of feedback, that is. Okay, good. What is it? Where would you put the input? Right here, iref. So let's say iref is the feedback, is the input. iref is the input, and i out is the output. So what kind of feedback is it? Shunt series? Sure. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> we're sensing the current down in the source here, right? Right. So we're not connected right to this output, so we're connected to the source. That's series sensing. And how does this thing work? What it does is this is the input here. Now you shouldn't, just because I have a current here, that doesn't mean that's the, that is a clue to the kind of feedback, because we always can use this Norton equivalent business, right, to change the input to something else. So you shouldn't look at that. We should look at just what's going on. And the summing node's right here, right? And so there's a current coming in, and here's a feedback current going out. So this is the air current coming in. So sure enough, this is shunt sensing. So it's shunt, I mean shunt feedback. So that makes a low, this makes this a low impedance point, right? It makes this a high impedance point in the shunt series. Okay. So you really understand Wilson sources now, right? So. And we did this little business here of putting this extra transistor in, and all the purpose of that was was to equalize the VD sats. I mean, some, if you want I ref to exactly track I out to track I ref, you want the VD sats of all these transistors of these, uh, particularly M2 and M3. It's the lower transistors that really set the current, right? These upper guys don't really set the current. It's this diode connection on here that really sets the current of this leg equal to the current of this leg. So that means the IDS, VDSs of these two transistors should be the same, because it's these transistors that set the current. I mean, a current, transistors always, you know, the drain and sources are always the same, right? So the current here is going to be the same as the current there. There's no way to get it out of this. Current here is going to be the same as the current here. So these two transistors really can't do anything about changing the current. It's these two that do that, and so we want to make the VDSs of these two the same. And that's what this transistor does. Doesn't, doesn't do anything else. Widlar, this is for bipolar, could have some bipolar problems, like the Widlar current source and these really simple ones that we did. You should know the, you know, the VBE is VT times natural log. That's that exponential relationship. It's the same as the subthreshold relationship that we have in MOS, right? Here's another low current bias one using <coughs> bipolar. Bipolar needs this. Ec to get these things to really be useful, you need that really strong exponential relationship. And you put MOS transistors in these from the same circuits, you don't get the really very small current ratios that you'd like to have between the output current and the reference current because the weaker square law dependence versus the exponential dependence. So these aren't so useful. Now we talk about supply independent biasing. That's where we put this upper current source connection above a bottom circuit right here. And this is the one that, you know, ends up with a VT over R is the current that we'll end up with. So you should recognize, there's a whole series of these I did, right? And uh, there's this self-bias stuff, okay, that there's an operating point condition that's zero, zero, so you have to somehow offset this upper. And I won't I won't ask anything about doing starting circuits, so don't worry about that. But you should recognize that you need to do these. This is a more complex one. This with the bipolar transistor in it, okay? GBE reference. So you should know all of these cases here. You should be able to analyze other ones. I should be able to give you one. You should be able to analyze it, okay? And if you recognize what a self-bias source is and how to, basically, all these circuits we do is we just kind of go around this loop, right? We just do sums of VBEs or VGSs and just calculate the relationship between this side and this side. That's all these circuits, that's all we did over and over again. And you can cascode these things. These self-bias sources still have a dependence on VDD, and you can make it better by cascoding these self-bias sources and make them even less dependent on the supply, okay? 
So it's this is just pure. Ca so the self bias stuff here. This is just making yourself a little more independent of the bias foliage by doing this cascoding. Okay, and we can use these loads. So then we start using these current sources of load, which was very desirable. Okay, so do that. Okay, question. Want a break? Uh, okay, three minutes. Okay. Uh, yes. So this is our champion part of our uh, project, right? So we did a bunch of calls, and our target is this. You know where this part comes from? Uh, <laughs> it's a direct feed through. When your transistor, when your circuits first starts, this op amp hasn't responded at all yet, right? So what happens? It's just kind of a divider between this. And the input impedance look into your circuit here, right? And then when the pseudo amplifier begins to have a low impedance, then that division, that voltage division goes away, right? My other question was, David said, you know how this is a shine, this is shine, right? Yeah, shine, shine. The feedback factor when they're doing the standard discussion, but I calculated the feedback factor should be the negative one over this resistance. He was analyzing it as a series shunt feedback. Uh, one it's it's one. It's two. No, this is not right. It's actually two, right? And the answer is, I mean, if your input's coming from here, right, the gain's going to. So what's the gain of the circuit? Two, right, yeah. And, and it's not one over F, it's not three, right? This is, it'd be one third if it was coming from here. You put the input here. So why do we analyze it that way? Why do we analyze it here? I don't know why he did that. Oh, he did that to say that the closed the open loop gain that you needed for this circuit to work was like, uh, he calculated that with this one third factor. Yeah, you shouldn't have. Yeah, it's all confusing. So what he was doing was saying, okay, let's just forget about feedback. Let's not call this F. Let's just call what happens from here to here, okay? And we're doing this clo this loop method, right? Okay. Then from here to here, you see this this ratio here is one third, right? Okay. And then the gain from here to here, so that's sort of the loop gain of this thing, right? But I wouldn't do it that way. I would do it our way, right? Just use F and use A0 and figure loading effects on the basic amplifier. So this is this is that loop method, okay? Method two, okay? Okay. Yeah, do Possibly do. What's your name? I have a few projects here. Um, Carry him around forever. Tan Ho and Tony Shi, David Mason, Shiji Lee. I have Win Tunes homework of uh, uh, midterm. Which one? What was yours? Um, Richard and Eric. Richard and Eric. Yes. Um, I have yours, but not here. Okay. Yeah. I. Um, yeah. So, yeah. We've graded yours, and I've got scores for you and everything. But. Um, okay. I think that was. I'm in midterm. Your midterm's missing too. Yeah. Well. You was ten, turned in for a regrade or something. Or? <laughs> I don't have it. Your midterm. Maybe the. I mean, I think we have your grade, but. Um, um, I will try to collect everything together okay. for next Monday. So okay. I'll be there. You'll be there. Okay. Right. Can you tell how, how, how the feedback for the Cascoe current source? Like, I, I understand the sensing, but what about the feedback? So it's basically this circuit right here, right? So it, it's kind of this is cascoding, right? If we just Put it, we put a resistor down in, this, in the source here, is effectively what we're doing, right? When we cascode 
as far as this transistor is concerned, right? We, we do this, right? That's what we're doing. So this is same as this. You're asking about the feedback, what type of feedback it is? Yeah, Oh, it's, it's as I was on the notes thing. It's just, you know, it's this thing here, right? Just yeah. Okay. So this is Pete's, okay? All right? So I turned it upside down, okay? But, okay, so looking up into here, looking into here, what is this? This is like R0. Mm -hmm. So I, let me just get down to the essence here. It's the current into here with this being R0. Mm -hmm. And I can, what's the input here? Well, the input here is really it's the voltage, right? Okay, it's the voltage on this node right here. Okay. I could turn to a current one. But, okay, so looking into here, what do we have? Well, this, this is the V feedback, right? This is I out, but it's being sensed in the source, so that's we're sensing... I feedback in as into the source, right? And the feedback factor is going to be V feedback is equal to R0 times I in feedback. So the feedback factor is R0 here. Oh, I mean, like, you have to, feedback is, uh, what's it called, series? So we've got feedback. So this is, it's we're sensing series and it's being fed back in series, so it's a series series. I, I don't understand why the feedback is series. So it's a series series under the, the left. Feedback here, here's V in, here's the feedback voltage, and here's the difference. Mm. So there's only one single transistor feedback? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's one of those. It's a little <laughs> <laughs> little nasty, right? You went over like one or two yeah, I did the source follower. I did this. Yeah. Oh, I see. See it? Similar to source follower. Yeah, it's kind of yeah, similar to source follower. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, this question here, like you said, uh, you want to cancel the capacitor. Does that mean like just to make the impedance of the display infinite? Make the L that resonant thing I talked about, that L C thing, I make a squared L. That that that's something. But then like. Because like, I think like in, Paris, in the Paris lecture, you said something like, you just have, like, that's only with the inductor in the capacitor. But it keeps working. It works with resistors too. That's your homework on this. That's the work, but there's a second term which comes just Q squared over 1 plus Q squared. Yeah. It'll tweak on it. Yeah, not exactly the same. Thing. Okay. Let's roll them. 20 minutes left. Okay, so... Output stages. Um, I think you all are experts in output stages for these projects, right? Um, output stages are, it's, you know, we, the small signal stuff we've been talking about has all been, except for this saturating effect of the differential pair, we have too much signal, we have a current. Output stages are different because they really are dealing with large signal swings. And as you know in your projects, how important that is, right? To be able to swing a big value at your output is a very challenging thing. And it's become a lot more challenging. Yeah, that's probably maybe the, the opportunity that you guys have, right? As the voltage scales, as the, pro as the supply voltage scales, these problems of getting maximum swing at the output is going to get more and more difficult, right? Um, transistors will get better, but that swing's going down. I mean, right now, the state of the art, you guys, let's say you're out working in, you know, two or three years, let's say, something like that. Maybe some of you lots of that. So you'll be working, in three years, there'll be two more generations of process. That'll probably be, you guys will, some of you will be started working, in, let's say, in three or four years from now, will be 90, maybe 65 nanometer. 65 nanometer will probably have a supply voltage of something on the order of, you know, seven tenths of a volt. So you're going to look back in the good old days of 1.2 volts, right? <laughs> like, wow, gee, we had so much voltage and that was really easy, right? We could, you know, you know and so you're going to say, 
boy, he just can't design anymore. Boy, this 0.7 volts impossible. Yeah, forget it. I'm not going to do it. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, give me a bipolar device. You know, so <laughs> it's going to just keep happening to you. And really, when places where it really happens is in the output stages, right? I mean, the old push-pull. I mean, for your, you could see at 1.3 volts, the um, the old common drain, you know, the source follower like push pull circuits just didn't work for almost any of the things we had, right? We just that was that was the common output stage. And I think as soon as you get down to like this 1.3 volts, you know, with VTs even as low as 0.3, 0.3 volts is a low value for VT. Let me tell you. I mean, it wasn't very many years ago, five years ago, VTs were running six tenths of a volt or so, you know, half a volt at least, right? Now, three-tenths is pretty small, and it causes a lot of leakage current problems for the digital guys. They're having a lot of problems with that, you know. For us, it doesn't matter. We we don't care about we got current running all the time anyway, so we don't care about this leakage current problem, right? That's their problem. Okay, so, um, okay. Again, it's the old swing business. So this is large signal problems. When do transistors go out of linear region operation? So that's really the important task here, right? And that's the large signal problem. And that's a, this is a little design example I gave here. You should understand what. Now, something I should mention. Let's go back to this for a second. This circuit right here also can be a slew rate problem. Okay? Some of you may see this. Why can this be a slew rate problem? What happens when this transistor cuts off? What does. And let's say I have a capacitor here instead of a resistor. If this transistor cuts off and I have a capacitor here, What's going to ha What's this output going to do? It's just going to ramp down. It's just going to be. It's going to go into the slew condition, right? So it's very similar to that input differential pair. So slewing doesn't always have to only happen at the differential pairs. It can happen anywhere you have a current source and a transistor driving a node, right? If that transistor turns off, then you end up with a current source. It's the only thing you have. If it's driving a big capacitor, you've got a slew condition, okay, right? And so, that, so slewing can actually in your projects can either be different for uh, rising and falling depending on what's causing the slewing. I mean, this one here, as we go higher and higher voltage on the input, we get this transistor can turn out more and more current, right? So unlikely we'll have a slewing problem in the positive direction here. We'll have a slewing problem is in the negative direction, where this we only have this current source trying to provide current. So, little message there. Okay, so we did a lot of stuff on analyzing that efficiency, total power in as measured from the supplies to delivered to the load. That's the efficiency problem. Right? Well, I was going to do that. Uh, I guess I don't have time. Not then. I mean, I was going to look at show you some RF power amps and stuff like that. It, you can look in the lecture notes. It, 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 there's the last lecture, I think, in your lecture notes there. You should go through it. You'll see a pa it's a paper that was given at the International Solid State Circuits Conference, which is in February. I should say something about that. Um, and you'll look at the circuits in there. You'll see this is a state of the art 802.11a Wi Fi chip, and they'll show you the circuits inside that. And you'll recognize those circuits in there. You'll be able to analyze most of them. Should be able to. This International Solid State Circuits Conference, let me just tell you about that. It's in February. It's in San Francisco, so it's not very far away. There, it does cost a little bit, even for students, but there's a really discounted rate for students. So if you can get somebody to pony up the money for it, uh, they do have people watching the doors when, if we're going to the talk. So it's a little hard to sneak in. You can. You probably can work out a little bit. But, you know, you <laughs> <laughs> but um, that is the premier circuits conference. That is the conference where people go in and talk about stuff we talk about in this course. Now, it's digital as well as analog, but it's pretty well balanced. I mean, I'd say, you know, probably half the sessions are something to do with analog. There'll be maybe a more application driven, like there'll be sessions on wireless or there sections on, you know, driving high speed serial lines, which actually is very much an analog problem. These are a lot of the same circuits we do, right? And then there'll be op amps and all sorts of stuff. So it's a, it, that is the premier conference of what's going on in circuit design, International Solid State Circuits Conference. And I just recommend if you get a chance to go to it, do it, because it's really an opportunity because it's right here in San Francisco and it's, I mean, people from all over the world come here. It's kind of equal people from Japan, Europe, and the United States, so it's the, you know, major conference for the world in this stuff, right? So, um, so it's a 
good opportunity for you to see what's going on. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff, that's the place to see it. Okay. I'll be there. <laughs> I'll check up on you. See you in here. <laughs> okay. Let's. Um, okay. So this is this. MOS inverter output swing thing, and a lot of you use this for the output stage. This is kind of become the default output circuit. Now, this one here with a current source load, of course, doesn't drive in both directions. A lot of you have been using a uh, inverter where you have tie these off or put some voltage translation between them, and that seems to work pretty well for the projects we've given you. So, um, class B, just too much voltage drop across these. Uh, VGSs, right, for the application, at least for the things that we've talked about. Okay, so that's that. So um, let's go to the next one. Uh, let's quickly do this. Got ten minutes. I better hurry up in there. Um, okay, so this is just differential pairs with a lot more stuff, right? <laughs> right. Um, this. Uh, this is not a good bias situation, right? Because we don't, we're not setting this voltage right at VD sat, right? We're setting this voltage here at a much higher, it's a VT plus a VD sat right there. So we're having a, so the swing in the positive direction or the swing in the negative direction isn't very good for this because we haven't done a good job of setting the voltages on this source here, right? Or this source here. So I think, you know, how does bias these kinds of circuits up so you get good swing? Be able to analyze that, I think, is a very important part of, you know, because this swing thing is so important, right, as I've said a hundred times. This is a better bias. This is, should I analyze, be able to analyze this bias strategy here? It's pretty straightforward, right? You know, we have to, this source here is set by the VT plus VD sat of this, right? So we have to buy, size this transistor with this transistor, make sure this is setting right at a VD sat of the same two, so. Understand how that's so it's a function of that current and this transistor size. Telescopic, interesting circuit. Then we did um, the folding at telescopic thing, right? Which is same circuit, differential pair, just fold it over. So this can swing. Why do this? The reason we want to do this is because it's output swing problems associated primarily with the fact that these two transistors, this and the inputs come in on this pair of transistors. In a telescopic, is this, if this, if, let's go back here. The problem with telescopic is if this input goes high, that means this source goes right up with it, right? So the source goes high. That means that the problem is, for this biasing condition, you can sort of see what's happening. This voltage has to go up high. So that means your swing in the negative direction on this output supply gets very small. So this circuit has a major problem, a swing in the negative direction for positive common mode swings. Now in your projects, we've set the common mode voltage to zero. So that's made this circuit much more viable because you haven't had to worry about a common mode swing on this input. So a lot of I've seen you using this telescopic thing. The big advantage of Cascode is that this output, you know, if we set this, not this biasing, but I could set more appropriate biasing, this voltage right here to a VD sat. And I get a, a swing that potentially go within two VD sats of each supply, independent of the common mode swing on this input. So we've decoupled the output swing from this input common mode. That's the advantage of this circuit. Okay. And also, so now, what's the disadvantage of it? Well, you got this folding point right here, and that's going to introduce some more poles. Okay. They're fairly far out because it's looking like one over GM, but that's another pole location. I mean, the second pole will probably be set by something like one over GM. So this could be where the second pole will be set. Okay. Now, for, usually that's pretty far out, so it's really not a problem. In this circuit, typically, if we drive only a capacitance and don't need an output stage, this is a circuit that is sort of self-compensated. It will be compensated by the load capacitance if the load capacitance is large enough. Okay. For your circuits, what will happen is if you put, if you have two stages, you put a bigger and bigger load capacitance on it, what will happen is the second pole will start moving in. That's independent of the compensation pole. You can start to have stability problems. So typically in your circuit, as you, these two stage things, you'll end up with a compensation problem if you have 
or stability problem, you have too much load capacitance. This circuit never has that problem. This circuit has a problem of too little load capacitance, right? Because the compensation is right at this output pole, right here. And if the load capacitance gets too small compared to where the second pole is coming in from this folding point, you can end up with having a stability problem there. If you add more load capacitance, that moves the compensation pole back, okay, and you end up being more and more stable, right? So this pole, this circuit typically has 90 degrees of phase margin. And you can't do anything about it. It's 90, it's going to be 90, it stays 90, right? So it's nice in a way. Just takes one design problem just off the table. This, you know, as long as you have a big enough load capacitance. And that's true of the telescopic, single stage circuit as well. Okay, so we did lots of analysis of that. I talked about the high swing business here. That was what this is all about. Okay, so that's that. Hey, I'll answer any questions. If you've got any questions, you know, what I'm going to get put on the exam or not, I'll. Yes? Oh, does it mean they use the photo catalog? Here's my coin. If they use the photo catalog, I don't need to have an output stage. If you're driving a pure capacitance, if you're driving a resistance, like we've done to you in all the projects this semester, then you got to have an output stage, right? <laughs> and quite often you have to drive resistances. I mean, so that's not, not a, makes the problems more interesting. Yes. Did you say anything about a review session? <laughs> I said we would talk to the TAs. <laughs> and I'll be in my office on Monday, bright and early, 9.30, 5. <laughs> Can we talk to the TAs of when it's going to be? Yeah, ask them to, ask them to, I'll ask them to do a review session, and if they're around, I'm sure they'll do it. Okay. okay. Yes? Um, is it possible because the final is on Saturday? Um, so besides, you have office hour on Monday. Do you have? Can we have more? Can I have more office hours? Maybe I'll just live in my office next week and just come by any time. <laughs> 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 yeah. I'll try it again. We'll see how many people show up on Monday. You know, if, if it's a big crowd on Monday, I can do it again. I can't do it Wednesday. I have some stuff going on Wednesday, but I I could do it Thursday maybe. So. Uh, so, but let, let's see. Let's see what happens Monday. See how many people show up. Bode plots. You definitely know how to do Bode plots because that drives all that stability stuff we talked about, right? So, really know how to do those things, right? So, um, and phase margin, all that stuff. That gets into our frequency response stuff. So, okay. So let's go back here. Feedback. Now, I don't have much time to go over it now, but we've been doing that for quite a while now. Obviously, you know what you need to know there, right? If I give you a circuit, identify the kind of feedback, be able to figure out the, the feedback factor F, be able to figure out the loading on the basic amplifier. If you do the problems the way I have ta taught about it in class, right? Which is, you know, figure out the basic amplifier, figure out the loading effect, put them together, Life will be a lot easier for us when we grade it because we'll know to look for that approach. The feedback strategy where you solve for the loop gain is a good way to do these problems. I will not doubt deny that. In fact, it's probably more accurate in some sense because there's some there's some things we're throwing out. We're, we throw out the feedback backwards through the basic ample, through the feedback circuit when we do ours. Small errors if you have large loop gain, so it's not very important. It won't be exactly what you get out of spice. So solving the problem, this, you know, you know, the breaking the loop method and driving around the loop is a good way to do them. But I would advise you not to do those on this exam, okay? Because if you do that and we don't recognize it, then you kind of end up with some weird answer, and we won't be able to give you any partial credit, okay? So, so I just if you, <laughs> I suggested doing the problems. Identify the feedback, identify the basic amplifier, figure out the loading effect on the basic amplifier, multiply the two together to get the loop gain, as opposed to breaking the loop and calculating it around okay, that approach. So be able to identify feedback for all, and we gave a lot of different examples, and you should know all those equations and all that stuff. So stability, your favorite subject. 
you're all becoming experts in this, I know, right now, right? And um, how do you identify stability, this whole business about this thing here about how the frequency response changes when you get clear in your mind between loop responses, you know, the loop gain, that's what we plot when we figure out stability, the closed loop response, which is what you look like from input to output with the loop closed. It's sort of the response around the loop, so you break it and figure out the response around the loop. Then there's the response from the input to output with the loop closed. That's the closed loop gain as opposed to the, to the loop gain, right? Or the loop gain response versus the closed loop response. So get those things clear. I, you know, there's, there's two or three different things there. Right? So you should be able to look at a, should be able to look at curves like this, figure out how to make them stable. You know what to look at, what to look for, how you what how you'd have to move poles to make it stable, that kind of thing. This the, this Nyquist thing, forget that. It's, um, <laughs> uh, okay, should understand the relationship between phase margin and. Um, transient response and frequency response, right? As frequency response gets less, you start to get this peaking business, and you begin to see ripples in your transient response, right? So there's a relation, and that's all to do with how close you are to becoming unstable. And phase margins is a m metric that tells you how close you are to stable. If you have zero degrees phase margin, you're right at the hairy edge of being unstable. Things like almost an oscillator. As you get more and more phase margin, frequency response stops this peaking effect and you stop having this ripple stuff goes on. Right. How you compensate something, narrow band compensation, and of course pole splitting, you know, if that particularly interesting because we often use this Miller approach to do compensation and we end up with this two of things that happen to us. One is that the second pole moves to a higher frequency typically. There's kind of two intermediate, now there's two cases, right? Now I analyze I guess I did it earlier, I guess, not here. But I did two cases, which was the case where you have a very large output capacitance relative to the pole associated with CGD. Then you don't see the Miller multiplication because the gain is killed because of this large output capacitance. That's one extreme. The other extreme is when the CGD is very large, you've made it larger because you put a compensation capacitor there. And then we see the full gain across this stage. We, then we do see the Miller multiplication effects. So those are sort of two limits. I won't give you a problem in the intermediate between those two limits. I'll go probably one of those two limits, so you should be able to identify that. That was back in the frequency response stuff where I did all that, right? Okay, pole splitting. This is all the ringing stuff. Slew rate. What causes slew rate? We talked about that. It's a current going into here. Actually, Josh asked me a question yesterday. He said, well, where's the, is it, where's the current coming from this other side? And I think I have a better answer for you. The current coming on this side, where's the answer current from the other side? It's coming from the transistor output here. I mean, this, what's happening here is the output transistor current source is driving a current into this side to be equal to the current on this side. And when it drives a current on this side, of course, it changes that output voltage. And so it's really, that's where the, the current comes from. But bottom line, what's happening here is that this voltage will ramp. This is an inverter, or it means an integrator, and it will just integrate this current. Okay, and the output voltage goes up because of that output current. And Get the slew. And I went through this little analysis of how the slew and compensation are all tied together. Then there's this zero business associated with the Miller effect. You get zeros anytime you get a multiple paths going to the same point, and they have different responses. Like when the differential pair, when you have two paths going to that output pole, you'll get this doublet thing, right, which is a pole zero pair, which because you'll get a zero because you have two paths coming to the same point. Right? So anytime you'll always have these zeros. Sometimes they're important, sometimes they're not. <coughs> You have to check. You know, very difficult to analyze, actually. Okay, one minute. What's what I should say? Anything more to say? Well, um, I won't give you any stuff about switch capacitor filters or A to D converters. Maybe one little problem about inductors. Okay, right. Um, that's it. See you uh, in a week, next Monday. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> it's a good class.
for the feedback? You mean solving for the feedback? What do you mean by not breaking the loop? If that's how do you multiply the things without the game from breaking the loop? Well, you do break the loop, right? I just meant the break the loop method that was in the sort of did one day in the lecture, right? You talked about. We have. I mean, you mean the way we should do it is find AF, find. That's the way to do it, right? Yeah. I thought that was breaking the loop. Well, I mean, I, I mean, there will put on definitions, but the method memory. One day I said, okay, we can go in there, break this, drive this from the point, and look at the voltage here, and go around the whole circuit. Oh. I call that the breaking the loop. I so ignored do that because it was not as easy as. <laughs> It's actually easier in a way because really? you don't have to identify feedback, right? You just, you just figure out what the loop is and go around it. You don't have to do